So why are we here? We're here to talk about the problem. So uh, in 2015, March 2015, a guy called Tom Jonas and a couple of other friends started a, a new business. They wanted to take on some big incumbents and started out from doing so by bringing some pretty um, light technology to market, which the incumbents considered to be uh, not of the same scale of interest to their customers. They were never particularly bothered about it. Um, fast forward just a few years, that business, Monzo, now has a million users and its most recent fund rounding fund raise last week was valued at a billion dollars. But whether they're talking about Monzo, whether we're talking about the growth of Audi and Lidl, whether we're talking about Babylon Health, it doesn't really matter. And to be honest, you've all heard that so many times you're probably bored of hearing it. It's a little bit cliche to talk about startups and the pace of change and change in consumer behaviour. But the fact is, uh, yeah, we're having to spend huge amounts of money responding to it. Businesses are spending millions and billions of pounds trying to transform themselves to compete with these new businesses. And they're starting to do a good job. The cost is, of the business is coming down, the customer experience is slowly improving. But is it enough to keep pace with the arrival of these new businesses? So a number of years ago, um, uh, Clayton Christensen, uh, the godfather of disruption, uh, said this. So he didn't feel that a large uh, business uh, could successfully uh, continue to innovate. So he talked about the innovator's dilemma and how the success of that business was built around doing one thing very, very well and very, very consistently. So um, the processes, the business model, the, the risk, the incentives just drives the success of that business. So trying to do anything else is just really, really difficult. Um, so we think it's time for a, a plan B, and actually some of uh, Clayton's good friends in a side wrote a great book uh, last year called Dual Transformation. If anyone's had a chance to read this, but it's got a very simple idea in it, which we think is great, which is that you need to transform your business of today while building your business of tomorrow. Um, and you need to do both those things at the same time. The big question is, how do you do them? So over the last few months, there's been a launch of a number of uh, spin-outs from well-known brands in the UK. So Jax is a new business by, from Tesco, which has been launched in response to Audi and the little Zip is a new brand that hasn't yet launched, but it's just been announced. So it's going to be uh, launching next year, which is by, from Premier Inn. And so they're doing this to target a new customer base that they're not currently launching with their Premier Inn brand. If you look through, um, actually, this is also very recent. This is RBS. This is Metal. This was launched a couple of weeks ago. This is a new digital challenger bank targeting the SME market. And then a few years further back, you've got Now TV response to the arrival of Netflix uh, and the unbundling of their traditional business model. Uh, and you've got things like Drive Now, where people are starting to rent cars rather than buy them. So people are already starting to do this. Uh, and there was a really interesting piece of work by um, some professors at Harvard and Stanford Business School that looked at uh, 35 different um, uh, disruptive business ideas across 19 different businesses in, in eight different sectors. And they identified four uh, organizational models for how people have seen them. They looked at this, these three here, functional, cross-functional, and unsupported teams. And then they came up with this idea of the ambidextrous organization, where it's a business on the side which reports into the same general manager. And they found that 90% of businesses following this model were successful in pursuing their breakthrough venture. Uh, so what we're starting to see here is an idea that if you organize in a different way, you will increase your chances of success. But is doing that enough? We don't think so. Uh, so this is a quite a famous chart from the startup world. Um, so I found this on the Hacker News website, which is where entrepreneurs share lots of interesting links. And this, talk, this charts the journey of a startup. So this here is called the TechCrunch Peak of Initiation. So when they launch, they get some, some uh, press on TechCrunch and things take off. But then you have this period over here, a big trough of, so of sorrow, as it's called. And then if you get up here, you're hopefully going to see some success. But the thing is, that's a journey that not that many businesses actually realise. Most of them actually just drop off the edge of a cliff. And so starting new ventures isn't easy, whether it's inside a business or outside of a business. So what do you need to do 
turn on top of that. And I think for everyone in this room, we have an additional challenge on, uh, on top of launching new ventures, which is we have an extra customer. We have our board we're having to work with, as well as our end customer, which makes things particularly difficult. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the, the B2 business model, which we think is an idea for how you can increase the chance of success of your spin-out. And at the heart of it is a really very simple idea, uh, and it's one that if you look at uh, businesses like Amazon, Google, Facebook, they all say time and time again, and that is that they have designed themselves to have more bats per unit of time than anybody else. So that's a very American way of saying they're going to have more goes. So they've designed themselves to be more experimental and in doing so are trying to learn faster than their competitors. And we think you can learn faster by trying to create learning loops across the whole business. Now some of this will be very familiar with you. Um, what we've done really here is we're starting to bring together a couple of different models from different places, both academia and management science, but also different parts of the startup world. So this idea of how you can find out what your new uh, venture would do, how you can get to the point where you have actual proof that it's doing that, how you can uh, drive growth, and how you can um, get to market. So a little bit uh, about discovery. So um, one of the challenges that we have when launching new businesses, or we all do, is that a huge amount of effort goes into creating a business case to get the investment required to be able to kick off that project. And what do, when doing so, we are tying up a whole lot of assumptions in a model, which at that point in time are, are unproven. Uh, and I think this quote uh, is, is a really brilliant one. Now, we're going about doing this, building our investment cases with all this uncertainty, but shouldn't there be a way where actually we can uh, introduce uh, some learnings much, much earlier on? So this is a model that we, and some other people we use, called the Opportunity and Solution Tree. And really what it suggests is it's much, much earlier in the product development life cycle, you start to think about a variety of different territories that you can play in. Because quite often what happens is people will come up with a single idea, they'll build a great prototype around it, and they'll get a lot of excitement from their stakeholders in that single prototype. And then the expectation is that that is what will be built. So you're building a lot of expectation around a single thing. But really, when you're so early on, you actually need to keep a much, much broader view of the opportunity that you can play. And really, what you're trying to do in this, this uh, stage of the journey is uh, reduce uncertainty. So really you're thinking about desirability, viability, and feasibility. What are the different things that you can accelerate to get the learnings around those, ideally without having to build anything? Is it possible to validate your assumptions around cost to market, um, cost to acquisition, without having an exchange thing? Is it possible to work out what distribution channels would be without building anything? And that's the idea of the, uh, the discovery stage. The next is get to market. Uh, and uh, everyone in this room will, will have been involved in building an MVP at some point. Uh, I was involved in a conversation the other day. We were talking about MVP1, MVP2, MVP3. So the, the language is being used, but it's being used somewhat uh, incorrectly, let's say. Uh, but there's also this big big challenge, which is how is it that you can launch early enough and be comfortable in doing so? It doesn't need to be a launch to the whole world. How can you get to the point where you can start to get some learning much, much sooner? So Marty Hagen uh, is a, a famous product management um, executive. So he was at HP, um, eBay, and a whole bunch of other places, and goes and coaches people. And he talks about this, and if you listen to Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, he talks about if you haven't launched, uh, you're not embarrassed embarrassed when you launch, you haven't launched early enough. And that's very hard for people sat in this room when we're thinking about the brands that we're launching under. But the point is that it allows you to learn um, much quicker. And really what we're trying to do in this stage is get into a couple of different rhythms. One is this idea of continuous discovery. So it's not about just doing some research once, it's about getting into the rhythm of doing this time and time again. And then other one is around delivery cadence. How is it we're getting into those right rhythms around releasing? This next bit, I think, is a bit that people struggle with the most. I think this, the last section, this idea of agile and lean product development, people are quite familiar with. But when you're actually in market, uh, there's a whole other challenge you realise. People um, think that it's just a case of launching it and then marketing it. 
this idea of just pursuing relentlessly a roadmap that you described six months ago when you were writing your original business case. But the point is things change, customers don't do what they said they were going to do in research. But what teams are doing is they're just chasing a roadmap of features that you described a while ago. Lots of people talk about going into BAU, uh, which is a word we, we hate. Um, we think it should be banned. Because this idea of business as usual just doesn't work for new ventures. We're operating in markets which aren't usual. Uh, there's so many new competitors, so many things happening. If we act as usual, we just won't be continuing to innovate the way that we need to. Um, there's a term that's used uh, very, very heavily in the startup world, which is this idea of product market fit. Uh, and it's something that um, people in the new ventures from bigger businesses aren't as familiar with. So this idea is where you get to the point where you have proof that customers really, really need your product. This isn't necessarily about downloads or sign-ups. It's about where there's an understanding of the value that they've realized from using the product. So as I was saying before, people quite often will just pursue features on a roadmap. But they're not actually thinking about what is required to get to the point where we have that proof. What do we need to change? What do we need to improve? This is Mark Anderson, Anderson Horowitz, so one of the most famous VCs in the Valley. And he talks about you know, having to change absolutely everything to get to product market fit, which is something that's very, very hard to do when you spend months building a business case, persuading all your stakeholders around you to support that thing, and then going out and building it. You might at that point spend a huge amount of time and resources getting to market. But then to say, we're going to change things, it you know, it's a very difficult environment to try and do that. But it's what the startups do fantastically well. And they'll change absolutely anything to get to that point of proof. Uh, next is growth. Um, traditional marketing approaches don't work for new ventures, in our experience. So the idea of an annual planning cycle, <coughs> a quarterly planning cycle, just isn't fast enough. What, again, lots of startups are trying to do bring product and marketing really, really tightly together as one and build rhythms of learning. This idea, as much as, as you do with agile product development, how can you do agile marketing or uh, growth marketing, as it's called? This guy here, Charmath, was the head of growth at Facebook. And he built out a whole growth team there. Uh, and it, it was constructed of people that you wouldn't usually be familiar with having uh, in marketing teams. It was data scientists, engineers, product managers. And what he was trying to do is continuously work through loops of learning. So it was a data-led approach that allows them to benchmark where they are, but then systems that allow them to try <coughs> really, really, really quickly. Um, this is quite a famous uh, framework that's used in the startup world, which we find very, very useful. Um, they're called the pirate metrics. Um, and the idea is that what you do is you organize your activities across the different stages uh, of the sales funnel. So the idea here is, if you haven't got great activity going on deeper in the funnel, why would you uh, work on features there? So it gives you an opportunity to think about where you should play, where you should be prioritizing your efforts to get the most uh, results. So really this idea is how can you build learning loops across your whole business? It's not just about product development, it's about the whole business, and how can you build systems that they need to do that? So we think there's three enablers that are required to create an environment that allow you to do that kind of, that kind of working. Um, it's funding and setup, team and earth, work models, and relationship with the mothership. So just to go through these. So funding and setup, I already spoke a little bit about funding. And the way that we create business cases to get investment ventures creates a, um, a difficult environment from the start because we're building so much excitement around the thing that we're looking to launch. But really what we need to be doing is thinking about how can we fund the pursuit of the team against some outcomes or against some learnings. Rather than building some things or some features that we've described, how do we fund a team in pursuit of an outcome? Now that requires a different way of thinking about how you fund initiatives, but it also needs you to um, prepare your stakeholders in a very different way for what they need to do in playing well in supporting you. The second is um, thinking about your relationship with the, the, the mothership or the core business. So again, in the startup world, people ask, you know, what's your unfair advantage? What is it that you've got that nobody else has got? And uh, when you're coming from a corporate world, there's a huge amount of assets that you could play with. 
is a really interesting question. I think Costas will talk more about this. But how do you choose which things will be your unfair advantage? And how do you make sure that you don't take things with you that will slow you down? And then the final piece is around team and organization models. And there's actually quite a lot in this, and this is just one component of it. But there's new ways to organize, both from a skill set and a team design point of view, that enable them to work in the ways that I just described. So this is taken from a book called Hacking Growth. It's written by Sean Ellis, who's uh, coined the uh, Growth Hacker term. And it's one of the ways that he sees startups organizing their teams to drive growth. As you can see, they're organizing against pirate metrics. But what it suggests is there's different ways of doing things. And it goes from a marketing point of view, but also from a product level point of view. So often it's very easy just to rebuild the structures that we have in the main business because that's how we've done things. We are trying to work in completely different ways with different skill sets. So it requires different organization models. So in summary, transformations aren't enough. They have to happen. It's absolutely critical that they do. Core businesses that we're launching ventures from won't survive in the markets they've got, they're in, unless they do. So they have to happen, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, BAU isn't, doesn't cut it anymore. Uh, we need to create environments where it's learning as usual. And the B2B business is a model that enables that. So, my final question before I hand over to Costas, and then hope that his voice will uh, stand up, is what will your B2B business do? Thank you.